Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Liberty Mail with the Student Fellows of Faith and Freedom. Welcome back to Liberty Mail. I'm Aaron Jenks, and we are here in the underground studio at Grove City College, working for the Institute for Faith and Freedom. Today we have a special episode. Isaac Wheeler is our guest. Isaac is the current chair of the American Enterprise Institute here at Grove City College. He's written more than 100 national bylines for uh, leading publishers like the Dispatch or National Review, even the Wall Street Journal. And most importantly, here at Grove City, he's thoroughly involved. Uh, he's a political col columnist for the Grove City Collegian and also a contributor at the Acton Institute. So you have a lot on your plate, Isaac, but somehow you find time to sit down at Liberty Mail. So Always. thank you for coming. Dude, thanks for having me. This, this, will, this will be fun. Yeah, absolutely. So before we hop into stuff, uh, but today we will be talking about kind of Trump and DeSantis as the two leading uh, nominations for the Republican nomination. And we also want to touch on the political climate surrounding them. We're going to do kind of analysis of both of their presidencies or potential presidencies, therefore. And then I want to talk firstly about... This one uh, article you wrote, it's called Conservatives Hang Out with Liberals, The Ability to Engage with Others Despite Political Differences is a Lost Art. And can you just tell us a little of the story behind this? Probably like a quick synopsis of yeah, that article. Yeah, for sure. So um, it was basically partially rooted off of a poll that came out in, I want to say it was June, that said about 47% of American college students wouldn't choose to room with someone who voted differently from them in the 2020 Our presidential election. Our generation, right, too? Right, Generation yeah. Z. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's nuts. And to me, that illustrates that political polarization, it's, this is not just a political thing, right? This is, a, this is an increasing climate of people seeing politics as an extension of moral values. And, like, this has always been the case. Like, political polarization predates Trump, and it predates DeSantis, and, oh, and yeah. it predates everybody who's in the modern political climate. But what, what I describe in the article and what social scientists like Arthur Brooks and Jonathan Haidt have been talking about is a culture of what's known as fundamental attribution error, in which both political sides believe that their culture and values are rooted in basic benevolence and that the culture and values of the other side are rooted in basic malevolence, right? Mm. Lack of benevolence. Right? So here's an example from on the left. People justify voting for extreme progressive candidates because – some people, not all of them they – they justify voting for extreme progressives because, well, we may not like the super extreme progressive, but it's really the result of the fascist conspiracy theory peddling right that's driven us to vote for these people. Right? And so they're willing to admit that their vote is the result of a moral trade-off. But then they look at Trump voters and they say, well, they voted for Trump because they're bad people. Right? Right. They're voting for Trump because they don't care about character or values or democracy. Right? And it's, it's that fundamental attribution error. Because the fact is everyone's actions are somewhat indicative of their values. And to pretend that they're not is just that. It's an error. Yeah. Right? Trump doesn't make this any better. Right? Like the former president really amps up the attribution problems, especially – post the 2020 election, right? So many Trump voters polled for him in 2016 and 2020 both because they think he's the most electable thing the GOP has. And at a point, that was true, right? But for many people on the left, Trump voters are seen of rep as representative of fundamental moral deficiency within the, with, on the right. Now, to be fair, would this have happened with any GOP candidate? Yeah. But Trump... Trump's special. I mean, the guy's, <laughs> the guy's disapproval rating has been over 50% since March. March disapproval rating has been over 50% since March. Mm. And it's been well over 50% since March. His defensibility has not exactly increasing, and his ability to polarize definitely is. Yeah, so, I mean, it hits home with that our article is that value attribution. And then bringing Trump into the situation is, okay, is this man a leader that can either decrease or increase his value attribution, which... I think has been kind of deteriorating our kind of social uh, construct that we have in America and maybe just the public square of being able to talk to people with humility. And I also think that it's kind of the antithesis of what we're supposed to do as men of faith mm -hmm. uh, and expect, or just people of faith within uh, politics in America. And that's treating people with humility, loving one another, and going beyond just uh, political ideology as this is what your moral beliefs are rooted in. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's, there's a very real tendency among people in general, but especially political people, to pretend that the people who represent legitimate evil are completely different from us, right? Yeah. right? And the fact is they're not. Mm. It is fundamental attribution error or any of the vast plethora of other things that contribute to pol political polarization. They all live within us just as much as they live within everybody else. And so recognizing that, recognizing our own tendency to be polarized, tendency to be dysfunctional and tribalistic, is, is key to understanding that. And if you, don't, 
it's key to understanding the way human nature works, um, the nature of evil. It's key to understanding all those things. <laughs> and if you can't, then it's really going to kneecap your ability to see those things with a proper moral framework. Yeah, and sadly, that's what we're dealing with right now. But going forward, we have either DeSantis or Trump, I think, is the two uh, – head cows in this race, but we, we just don't head know. Head elephants. What, it's very important. We get the party. We don't know what's going forward. So I want to do kind of analysis of with this framework of what the political climate is right now and how we see maybe moving out of that or what we, th- what we think it ought to be. Let's go through what is the case for DeSantis as a nominee? What, is, uh, what do you consider him as achievements or abilities, uh, maybe the ability to decrease that value attribution. For sure, yeah. So I want to talk about the case for DeSantis independent of Trump, and then yes. we can talk about some some other things. So for me, the case for Ron DeSantis hinges on three things. One, you have a good governing record. You have some mm. serious economic growth in Florida. Approval ratings within, within the state are amazing. I mean, I don't know how many of you have paid super close attention to midterms, because I know so many Americans pay super close attention <laughs> to midterms. But DeSantis had a blowout election, destroyed Christ. He won Miami-Dade. This is, these are all signs of a candidate who has a serious ability to win. Mm. And that's both in terms of his own platform, but also in terms of his strategy. Like if you read political websites, there's a bunch of things talking about DeSantis' um, campaign strategy. Register a bunch of voters. Talk to the issues. Don't focus on one specific thing. And it really worked for him yeah. in a major way. He won by 20 points in Florida. That's insane. So good governing record. Um, approval within the party. He's got major name recognition within the party. He's a well-known guy. Uh, he pulled massive turnout in Florida. Mm. And when you look at all of the current GOP primary polls, straw polls, he polls at or near the top. So people know who this guy is. And I would say, at least on the right, the impression of him is fairly favorable. Mm. And then I guess the last thing is more of a negative argument in the sense of the GOP has to decide who's both qualified and able to carry the GOP torch going forward. Right, people talk about Mike Pence, Ted Cruz, Christine Nome. I don't think any of those people can win in a general election, mm-hmm. partially because they'd be kneecapped in the primary. I mean, if Mike Pence won the primary, he is not winning that primary. Like, sorry, <laughs> I I like Mike Pence. I think he's done a lot of really good stuff. Never going to win a primary. Can't win in general. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think the same argument can be made for a lot of people. If it's not DeSantis, what serious candidate are we waiting for? Well, who is the GOP waiting for who can actually be the standard bearer if it's not DeSantis? Yeah, it's a really good point, too, and because we have this seemingly changing of the guard. Yeah. And, and that is the pushback within the RNC right now is, okay, well, we have a leader that, that has this four-year term, President Trump. And so what is to happen with he has created this strong base within America – but then, yeah, you do have incredibly increasing support for Ron DeSantis within the RNC. So how does that changing of the guard take place? And these are all questions that it's going to be developing over the next couple of years. And especially that presidential uh, nomination within the party is going to be kind of fun and chaotic to oh, watch. It's, it's going to be great. Play yeah. out. Popcorn in abundance. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the other things to think about, especially on, like, again, I'm all my cards on the table. I'm a critic of President Trump and have been for a very, very long time, as long as I've been politically active, essentially, which hasn't been that long, but it is what it is. Mm. People on the very Trump critical side, some of them, not all, seem to have this idea that the next step for the Republican Party has to be a complete repudiation of Trump and picking of someone who completely doesn't share Trumpian values. That's not realistic. Mm. Like, Trump happened. You can't undo Trump. You can't undo the Trumpian movement. And as such, you're going to have to deal with the fact that the person that the Republican Party picks next to be its standard bearer, whenever it's not Trump, is going to be something, someone, something, can be someone who is very Trump-like in certain aspects, because that's just an incrementalist, that's just how candidates work, especially within a party. The candidate who, a candidate who has won what the candidate that comes after that tends to share some of those attributes because the party presumes, sometimes correctly, that those are winning characteristics. And so, mm-hmm. of course, the next guy is going to be a little bit Trumpian. Ron DeSantis is a little bit Trumpian, right? Like Rod Dreher of the American Conservative, he talks about common sense populism. We can talk about populism, but Ron DeSantis is very Trump-like. Yeah. And if you have to choose between picking Trump-like and Trump, maybe it's time to cut our losses. Mm, yeah, he does have a lot of attributes that draw similar or close parallels to Trump. And, and that was kind of what we saw as maybe rising uh, popularity around him 
Uh, he was kind of seen as side by side with Trump for a long time. But then, then we saw this growing uh, catechism between them two once this yeah. presidential nomination came into play. And so I think that going forward, it, it's in, interesting to think about uh, from, a, from my kind of stance is that I'm pessimistic when it comes to a lot of these oh, politi- political actors. Everywhere else in my life, I'd like to think that I'm optimist. Yeah. Can't you see how happy and joyful this podcast <laughs> has been for the past 10 minutes? But when, when we do talk about these values within society, and I think that the political climate is oh, well, you disagree with me. I'm going to treat that as a moral equivalent to uh, <laughs> being a, a killer, being yeah. someone who is just uh, dubious and, and wrong yeah. f- wrong within society, so yeah. I can treat you as such. Well, this is going back to that CNN poll, right, that, those 47%. That has very little, that percentage has very little to do with actual politics. That has mm. to do with people in Generation Z, a significant plurality, almost a majority of Generation Z saying, People who voted differently than me in the 2020 general election are not only making different political decisions, but they represent values that are fundamentally antithetical to who I am, mm-hmm. what I want to see reflected in the public sphere. And that, that's a problem because everyone's vote is a trade-off, with the exception of a few people who write in Jesus on their ballot. I'm sure those people exist. Everyone's vote is a trade-off. Mm-hmm. And if we can't acknowledge that everyone's votes are trade-offs and that we're all kind of thinking tactically around election season – that leads to a level of just being an ideologue that you cannot get out of, and that's, that's, it's a real problem. It is, and I also think that, okay, well, when I think about Ron DeSantis as that potential nomination, it's when we go back to that value, uh, what was it, value, uh, trans- value, value, value attribution. Value attribution error. Yes, and so I think, okay, can this leader decrease that? Because mm-hmm. we are attributing that to maybe that horrible mm-hmm. or... Uh, interaction that we see, but when we really actually get to know these people, like in your article, wow, they're actually a good person, you develop friendship, and life is so much more than political uh, (laughs) whims. But, so let's move on to Trump, if if we can. Oh boy, yes, we can. Let's start with his strengths, because I think uh, when you do see uh, either articles or podcasts coming from Trump supporters, and I I think they're right to say this, is that they have felt... uh, Mm. Mar- marked or, or mm-hmm. attacked when, okay, you have these conservative other writers who just constantly uh, crap on Trump yeah. for, for his uh, downfalls, which they're also right. But then, okay, well, what are his strengths? Like, can we at least prop him up? He, he got right. into the office. Yeah. He's been a leader for us, so at least support our leader, right? Yeah, we've got some judge appointments that are really good, some mm-hmm. justice appointments that are really, really good. Yeah, right. definitely so strengths. Yeah. When we're talking about Trump in 2022, I think it's really beneficial to talk – tactically about it mm. morally that's another political issue, strategy right? yeah to. exactly yeah, yeah. Okay. because the moral arguments against trump like look i i personally believe there are many moral arguments against mm. trump i don't really want to talk about those right now because i think at this point we are looking at we need to think about who can win elections mm. are about winning elections are not just about principles although they are about principles but someone has to win and so we need to look at trump through those eyes, especially when we're making the case for Ron DeSantis, because the argument for Ron DeSantis is that he is more, he is a tactically superior candidate to Trump, and running him is tactically superior to running Trump in 24. So let's talk about Trump. And for this, I want to use the two things that Trump has openly admitted that he really cares about, and they're his two favorite things, which are strength and winning, right? (laughs) So is Trump a strong candidate and is Trump a winning candidate? And it turns out for me, in my opinion, the answer is no on both fronts. So let's go okay. through this. Yeah, let me hear it. So strength, right? Trump's greatest strength has been, or one of his greatest strengths, has been his ability to act like he gets and understands ordinary people, right? So in 2016, he cultivated this persona, and to a point it is a persona, that opposed the D.C. elite, claimed to stick up for the little guy, mm-hmm. and understood the problems of the average American. This worked in large form. Massive swath of, swaths of people flocked to him. It worked in, in a major, major way. What's he talking about now in 2022? He's talking about the 2020 election. He's trying to get away from terrible press brought about by certain anti-Semitic rappers who shall remain nameless. Right? What's he talking about? His Keep little going. pet issues. Keep going. Right? He's talking about his little pet issues. Mm. And that is what he has decided to dedicate a great deal of his communication capital to, to talking about. None of this is – none of this represents an everyman persona. None of this represents his 2016 everyman persona that won him so much support. It actually betrays a flailing candidate that's lost the relatability and definitely has lost the outsider stra- status that once rallied mm-hmm. voters to him. 
So that's strength. Um, well, that's interesting because you're saying that, okay, well, what was one once strong and maybe uh, appealing to the base has yeah. now kind of left from his uh, platform, right? Yeah, look, I don't like Trump as a person or as a candidate. We can still but an- I understand for what why he, is, yeah. he was popular. Mm-hmm. It's pretty easy to do that if you, if you can look at this tactically and think about how, how voting works. I understand why, why, why it worked in 2016. I don't think whatever worked in 2016, it didn't work in 2020. Is it going to work in 24 mm-hmm. when the rot has set him further? I don't think so. So then winning, and this gets this segues perfectly into winning. Trump has been winning less and less for the party. So on the numbers front, in 2016, Trump wins with 304 electoral votes, mm. loses the popular election by like 3 million. Yeah. In 2018, Republicans lose the House. In 2020, polls, Trump polls 232 electoral votes okay. and loses and loses despite what some people think. In 2022, Republicans flop in the midterms, major bad showing in the midterms, and like squeak by to retake the House. Mm. Three of those elections happened directly under Trump's command of the party, right? And the 2022 midterms saw a bunch of Trump-friendly candidates like Doug Mastriano and Kerry Lake lose. Yes, Kerry Lake lost. <laughs> the fact that we have to say that. Anyway, You're this geared. is not a good trend for a man who prior- This is not a good trend for a man who prioritizes strength and winning. This cannot be the answer. You have this is this is a decreasing rate of return. Do do we really want to wait two more years for that rate of return to decrease further? Like to me, the only case for nominating Trump for the party is if there is some magic variable that is going to somehow reverse every electoral trend that he has set in place Hmm. in terms of his own power to win in the next two years. And I do not see that variable anywhere. Yeah. So for for those listening, I think Isaac makes a really good strong case. citing maybe like p- more political theory and, and bringing to you what maybe is not what you, in your news feed. But when we, when we think about maybe some of your shoes are in, it's, okay, well, maybe you have loyalty. Maybe uh, you want to keep, stick with your horse that already won you and has been maybe fighting against the things that you think are wrong in America. But then, yeah, you, you do have to step back and think about it. Well, if things that we do want to change, we want to change this value at attribution era, Error, and then we also wanted to change maybe political systems. Uh, who who is elect? Who has the electability within this race? And then also, I think even for myself, that decision doesn't have to be made yet. Like I, I said a little bit earlier, um, within the the nomination within the party, I hope and I think it's going to be uh, iron sharpens iron within uh, the nomination because I think they're both going to push each other, and it's going to give us the uh, electors, uh, or yeah, the electors. A uh, better uh, idea of what's going to happen Hopefully. going forward. I wish I was as optimistic mm-hmm. as that. So you say you're pessimistic, but then you say stuff like that. I'm like, oh, it's so hopeful. Well, yes, pessimistic so towards nice people's happen. character, honestly, yeah, sure. and yeah. versus these political actors and what they promise versus what we get. So that's why when, I mean, I can understand, at least have empathy and put myself in people's shoes sure. to where, okay, I know what I'm going to get with, with uh, former President Trump. I know what he has done. Um, and then maybe there's at least – there's a lot of unknown around DeSantis except, okay, yeah, there is this track record, like you mm-hmm. said, uh, as him as governor. But can he translate that to the presidential Yeah, position? and that's a, that's a perfectly rational question. Again, I'm a journalist. I see the world as a battle of – I see the world more as a battle of perceptions as mm. opposed to policies. Yeah. This is – elections are in a lot. A great deal of electoral stuff is about perceptions. So – Think about let, – let's, let's try and take those perceptions and look at Trump and DeSantis side by side, right? So on the right, DeSantis has political savvy. He has a pretty good approval rating and he's got a lot of strategic fortitude to pose a serious challenge to a Democratic candidate in 24. Mm. Trump, for lack of a better term, is lost in the shadow of his own toxic associations. So when you look at perceptions on the left of Trump, they are almost completely negative. When you look at segments of the right, they are – large segments of the right, they are either ambivalent or negative. The only group that maintains positive associations of Trump is people who supported Trump before. And I don't see those, I don't see that increasing. Trump's Mm -hmm. electability does not increase day by day, partially because of his own actions, partially because he's an old candidate, right? His star is burning out. And in my mind, he's not, like his own personal conservatism or values side, he is no longer a feasible standard bearer for the GOP. Mm -hmm. Right. And also, if I'm a democratic strategist, right, and I have these and I'm I like looking this point at these two, yeah. Yeah. If I if I'm looking at these two candidates, 
what am I going to do with Trump? I'm going to throw negative co- coverage at him from every angle. And for better or for worse, a bunch of it's going to stick. Right? I'm going to play up the bad press. He's an extremist. He's a flailing weak sauce candidate. Mm. And for a bunch of people across America, that strategy is going to work really, really well. With DeSantis, I'm probably going to do the same thing, but it's not going to stick nearly as much. Mm. That's the thing about – that is the trade off of people who are unknowns or outsiders to the presidential scene – is that like you're gonna like if I'm a democratic strategist, I'm gonna throw negative press at DeSantis, but that is it's nowhere near the absolute just baby candy stealing that running negative press against Trump is gonna be. Well, I also think, well, I think I, I was hoping that you did say, and I'm happy you did because they absolutely will throw the kind of the same strategy towards them. Mm-hmm. I already see it, and we have to think about that. Yeah, That's yeah. part of being an election realist. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, what is the other side gonna do? And I'm yeah. just gonna sit there. And let these things germinate in our little terrarium. And if you follow some of these progressive pages, you already see it happening. They are yeah. labeling, like we said earlier, there are Trumpisms within Ron DeSantis that he has taken upon himself. And so the left is grabbing upon that, and they are going to uh, criticize him constantly for having that. But I think what you say, will it stick or will it have credibility, especially with independent voters? Yeah. Uh, people in the middle who, okay, yeah, there may be political realists who are just saying, I don't know. I have common sense uh, mm-hmm. about my politics. I care about maybe big issues like the economics right now, uh, social issues too, but then I don't know where to go right now. Yeah, if you're a swing voter right now who has seen everything from November 3rd, 2020 to now, if you're, if you're a swing voter who has looked at everything that has played out since then, who do you actually have a less favorable impression of, Trump or DeSantis? Mm-hmm. Like, really? Trump. In my opinion, that is fairly obvious. Yeah. I think it's harder when you when you bring that into effect and then make that swing for, okay, well, President Biden or President Trump or President DeSantis. It just makes the very the average a little swing more. voters bashing their head against the wall at the prospect of another Biden-Trump race. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it, it is helpful to take out your feelings uh, out of this situation. Okay, how do I feel about my loyalties towards a certain nominee? Uh, yeah, no- nomination. Or how do I feel about... Uh, the past, what has happened in politics. Exactly. And you really, I think, you have to think about, okay, who's going to win and who's going to lose? Yeah, to quote a very famous conservative influencer, facts don't care about your feelings, right? We all have feelings <laughs> about President Trump. Mm. We all have feelings about President Biden. We all have feelings about Ron, Governor Ron DeSantis. Outside of that, you have to think strategically mm. because elections are strategy. This isn't about who is the world's best conservative in the tradition of Edmund Burke, right? <laughs> This is about who can win elections. If I want to win elections, if you want anything resembling conservatism to win, right? If you, there are two things in that, right? If you want conservatism to win, those two things, it, it's time to throw the sport behind DeSantis. I just think it's the time at this yeah. point. Well, I also think that when you, when you think about this whole uh, aspect of involving the left in nomination too, it's okay, and then we go back to where, where we started in this podcast, and you have that value uh, attribution era. Yeah. I don't think the, the left, from a strategic, strategic stance, uh, decreases that attribution era. And I don't think that the nomination— no, I, Especially not with Trump at the helm. Yeah, or with President Biden, I, I'm referring to. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I, I don't think the left's doing that for, their, for themselves, so I think it opens up an opportunity for the RNC to at least put a new nomination for— yeah, yeah, because when you look at Trump and Biden, these are both known variables, mm-hmm. and everyone, no one is really going to change their opinions on Trump from here until 24, unless something really major happens. And in terms of Biden, yeah, people have been bi- bailing off the Biden train, but the hardcore supporters of Biden are still going to support him. Mm. They're not going to flip. So do you run that same simulation again? Do you run that same scenario again? And just, it's, that's just one, that doesn't help our level of fundamental value attribution error. But the other thing is just it's just really boring. <laughs> and, like, that, that is the one thing where my personal feelings come through. It's like that is a really boring You want to see a little more spice in this, right? Just something new. Please, <laughs> like, this is – these people are both – how old is Trump? 75? These people are both over 70. That's – Really boring. And what, Santa's in the 40s, late 40s, early 50s? He's not 75, the point (laughs) being, right? And, yeah, and obviously I think the strategic considerations, like, you you have to hit them with something different. You you, you cannot let them do what they're comfortable with. And what the left, what liberal media is really comfortable with is 
standing and dunking on former President Trump. Mm-hmm. That That's is what they're used to. That is a, that is that is their bread and butter. Don't give them the bread and butter. Give yeah. them something different. See what happens. And taking your own personal whims aside, does it does it look from everything you've read, everyone that you've talked to, that the RNC is leaning towards uh, nominating Ron DeSantis over Trump, or do you see that catechism no between both of them as? A more serious problem that's going to develop through this uh, election season. Um, the latter, yeah. yeah. I think I have no idea who the RNC is going to nominate. I can, I mean, a bunch of Trump's major donors have bailed on him. So interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the guy from Fox, who's um, Murdoch, bailed on Trump, right? And I think he said he backed to Santa. I'm not too familiar, recall, but okay. But he's, he's a major Fox guy, right? Bunch of money poured a bunch of money into Trump's campaign before has now turned on him. If that trend continues, I think it, it would make sense for the RNC to nominate DeSantis mm-hmm. because it's like, okay, who can pull the donors? Who can reach across to independents and swing voters in at least some sense, in at least some capacity? Not Trump. Yeah. Right. And I, I think it's also interesting from just theory aspect is this is happening on the left uh, just as much as it is oh, happening yeah. within the RNC. And so there is the same questions. I mean, we could do another 20 minutes, which we will not. But <laughs> between, okay, is, is Biden this nomination that's going to be the strong leader within our party? Or, not be a strong or do we move on? And so it, it's interesting seeing both political parties dealing with that. But maybe that makes you think, okay, wow, uh, we're more alike than we think we are. Uh, maybe we just need to move ahead with strategic planning instead of uh, personal feelings about yeah, nominations. Yeah, if the 24 presidential race ends up being a a – election between two upper 70s guys who have both run for president before i think it comes down to just ideology at that point yeah Yeah. that just that says something about the state of both of our parties Mm -hmm. right and look like we just briefly touch on the democratic thing like let's say gavin newsom runs for president which Mm -hmm. i don't think he will (laughs) but that is beside the point i'm not putting any money hypothetical if newsom and desantis runs that is different Mm -hmm. that in a sense, represents the two parties better than a Biden versus Trump election. And I think that could be really interesting because then it's not just persona versus persona, although it will be that to a sense. But there is a chance that we can have a national argument about issues Mm -hmm. again. Well, okay. Which would be really fun. It's going to be a a whirlwind over the next year. And honestly, let's retouch on this topic uh, later in the spring semester and any uh, upcoming activities that you have coming out, Isaac, or any um, plans or, or works that you want to kind of plug right now? Um, so the American Enterprise Institute at Grove City, we're looking to – we're prepping an event, which for legal reasons I can't say much about yet. <laughs> but when, when we come back in the spring, we can definitely talk about that. It should be – That's excitement. Secrecy if, is exciting. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. It's just like the poster that's like day by day being like pulled away. <laughs> there you and go. Eventually, eventually you get what's going to – there are going to be some exciting things. We'll, we'll, we'll get to those. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming and, and, Dude, this and was, talking this on this topic, Isaac. We appreciate you So here. much fun, so much joy. I also love hedgehogs. So like we'll end on a <laughs> really positive note and not talk about Trump anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, if, you're, if you're new to here, please hit the like button and subscribe button right below me. Thank you for checking in and listening to Liberty Mail. For more information on the Institute for Faith and Freedom, visit faithandfreedom.com.